All right, so welcome. Um, I'm David Smotridge. I'm the founder and medical director of La Jolla IVF. It's my pleasure to be here with you guys. Um, I have been in San Diego now for 20 years. I've been on my own for 18. Took me a year to build our facility. We've been there now for about 17 years. Because the laws in the state of California are very forward thinking with regards to both egg donation and surrogacy, because they are areas of interest of mine, I do a lot of these types of procedures. Uh, I've been told that I've done more surrogacy than any other doctor in the world. I've done over 3,500 cases of surrogacy on my own. On average, I do about 220 surrogate cycles every year. I was one of the first ever to do a male-male couple. Our first male-male couple was back in 1997. And in 1997, um, I still had an office which was related to a um, hospital. So I had to ask permission from the hospital to be able to do a case for a male-male couple, which the hospital was fine doing. But after I did my first case there, um, the rest of the doctors were not happy with the fact that I would dare to do a male-male couple. Okay, so um, that was the very first case. That couple indeed got pregnant. Uh, they were a very powerful couple in terms of attorney and, and um, cardiothoracic surgeon. They were able to change the law in the state of California so that when a child is born in the state of California with two males, that both males are written on the birth certificate. And so this is a major breakthrough that we had and that this was my case. Since that case, I've done over 700 male-male couples, about 650 of male-male couples in the last 10 years alone. So um, those are the things that I think are kind of important to know. Um, unfortunately, surrogacy in our country, and I understand in many other countries, um, get a lot of headlines, but unfortunately the headlines are very, very uh, inaccurate and rarely are they very positive with regards to surrogacy. Uh, Ricky Martin came out, I think, after he had his twins, in terms of surrogacy. And then after this, many times of situations, and I understood that the press was very negative downstairs earlier today, talking about, you know, a surrogate being a woman for rent and their uterus for rent and all of these kinds of things and that you buy babies and all that. Surrogates, by definition, is a woman who's had no problems getting pregnant. There are two different types of surrogacy. There's gestational surrogacy, where the woman who is carrying is not medically related to the child that she is carrying. And there is traditional surrogacy, where the woman who is pregnant is indeed genetically related to the child. It's very, very important to understand the differences, both medically as well as legally, okay? Um, in the old days, before we had IVF, all of the cases were done via insemination and they were traditional surrogacy. The problem with traditional surrogacy is that the woman who is caring is related to the child that she's carrying and therefore she has a lot of rights over the baby after the baby is delivered. And even if you have a written contract that says that she is going to give you the baby, um, there are situations where women change their minds and there are very few courts in the United States that will say, that she can't have the baby that she is genetically related that is you know, her baby and even though she had a written contract, she can claim, gee, I didn't understand or nobody perfectly explained this to me. And so that's why most of the patients that we work with are indeed gestational surrogates, okay? Surrogacy is really not a new phenomenon. The first surrogate is, is a traditional surrogate as explained uh, in the Bible. Hagar was Abraham's wife and Hagar had a child, Ishmael, with Abraham, and then um, the rest is history if you regard to surrogacy, but we don't do it that way anymore. Um, I don't know why this doesn't wanna work. Avi, do you wanna tell me? Oh, there we go. Um, in my clinic, as I mentioned, about 18 years ago, um, and so this is very important that many people don't really understand about how kind of cuckoo I am, if you will, after the hospital that I was working with said that they wouldn't let me take care of the gay male patients. Um, and we live in San Diego. San Diego is about a two and a half hour drive to Los Angeles. Uh, I went to some of my colleagues in Los Angeles and I went to Century City Hospital and they said it'd be their pleasure for me to take my patients there. And I started to drive with my patients up to LA, do procedures in the morning, come back and do cases after the cases, see patients in the afternoon. So for about a year and a half, I was driving to LA to take care of patients, 
that the hospitals in San Diego were not really interested in allowing me to take care of. Uh, my wife thought I was completely cuckoo. My rest of my family thought I was completely cuckoo, so I opened my own office, and that's really where La Jolla IVF was born. And so uh, male-male couples are very, very near and dear to my heart, as well as to my practice, because that's really what nudged me to build my own operating room in my own lab where I could tell everybody go F off if they told me where I, you know, who I can take care of and who I can't. And so since then, um, there's nobody that we've ever refused care. Uh, all the things that we do in the state of California, uh, I only do things that are illegal. I mean, a lot of things that we are doing, obviously I'm standing in a place where it is illegal to be talking about surrogacy, let alone doing surrogacy. Um, but we have been very blessed to take care of patients from all over the world, um, including Belgium. Uh, the women that are, have their babies born in the state of California, which again is the most open state, your children will have American passports. And I know that there are several lawyers here that will help kind of discuss what it's like to come back to Europe uh, after the child is born. Um, because of the different laws and because of how uh, unopen many of the different countries are. Um, I have babies in 92 different countries from all over the world. So um, there's probably very few countries on the map that you can come up with that we haven't helped a couple. And so everybody asks, okay, so where's the, you know, one that nobody's ever heard of? So I'll give you one. There is a very small island off of Australia that is a French island called New Caledonia. New Caledonia is supposed to be beautiful. I've never been there, but there's a diagnosis where women are born without a uterus. So they look like a woman, they have breasts, they have pubic hair, they attract men, but for, they don't have periods and they don't have a uterus. They have ovaries. So when I took care of this young lady, lovely, lovely, okay, there was one flight out of New Caledonia a week to come to the United States. So we started her meds there. She flew from New Caledonia to San Diego. We got eggs from her, sperm from her husband, created embryos, put the embryos into the surrogate. Surrogate fortunately carried twins, which was what they wanted. So um, that's kind of the furthest out there. We've had many countries in Africa where it's illegal. Even I'm a, though I'm a Jewish boy, I have a lot of patients from the Middle East, Abu Dhabi, <laughs> Dubai, Saudi patients have even come to us. So uh, we don't discriminate by that, but it's just a matter of, when people need this type of care, they come to see us and we've been very fortunate. And because I've been very progressive with regards to the patients that I want to take care of, everybody that we hire on my staff understands that that's the kind of patient they're going to take care of. And if they don't feel comfortable with that, that becomes very clear and we don't hire them. So that's Avi, one of my embryologists in the back. He's actually has a male partner he's been uh, with for 20 years and they're finally getting married this summer, finally. So anyhow, we work with a lot of different agencies. I don't have my own egg donor agency. I don't have my own surrogate agency. I truly feel that there's a conflict of interest if the doctor's office says, oh, come and use our surrogates, come and use our, our donors. So we have very close relationships with many different agencies, some of which are upstairs that we work with, um, as well as many other agencies in the San Diego area. Okay, very important. You need to have legal contracts in between you and the surrogate, you and the egg donor to protect you, to protect the surrogate, protect the entire process. Psychological evaluation. Is the surrogate indeed who she says she is? Does she have, they do legal and bound, back, background checks, excuse me, to make sure that indeed, you know, this is not a criminal or criminal family. She doesn't live with a criminal. All of these kinds of things are, are done by the agency health insurance for the surrogate, health insurance, what happens after the woman delivers and the babies are born. So this becomes an issue for international patients. What do you do with regards to insurance for the babies if God forbid the baby delivers early and has to be in the nursery? So these are the kinds of things that the agency should be helping you to try and guide you in terms of what is the best approach. Life insurance, we've had, Fortunately, it was not my patient, but in our town, we had a surrogate was driving her kids to school, pregnant for a couple. They got hit by a drunk driver and the surrogate died. So life insurance, what do you do when you have this young lady who's caring for somebody else and she gets killed in a car accident, something crazy like that. So that's part of the things that the agency should be talking about. 
psychological screening. So they do written screening, they do verbal screening, and they also have support groups. So, you know, this is a, a nice long relationship generally with the surrogate. And from the time you meet a surrogate till the time the baby comes, hopefully it's about a year, year and a half. Excuse me, because from the time I see a surrogate in my office till the time I can do a procedure for you, it's about eight to 10 weeks because there's a bunch of screening that we have to do, then we have to make sure that the agency has done all the legal stuff and all the insurance and all the psych stuff is done, and then we do the meds. And in our state, in the state of California, it's illegal for us to start the surrogate on injections without, an, without a clear document that protects everybody. So this is something that, you know, sometimes we say, okay, we really want to do a cycle in June, and everybody's rushing, 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 and the lawyers haven't done the paperwork, then I have to push the case to July because the paperwork's not done. Or, you know, they, and unfortunately, there are many different groups that are not thrilled with the fact that we're doing surrogacy. So some of the judges make it more difficult, and so they'll have the paperwork sit on their, on their, on their desk for a while, or, um, some people have now changed the law that everything has to be notarized, and so if you're in a country where notary is not easy to do, I mean, in, Sandy, in California, most of the banks will do a notary, or you know, a lot of people have notaries, but here it may be more difficult, so, and with the time changes and all that, it makes it difficult. Um, medical office, okay? What's fascinating to me is, obviously, there are many, many very capable IVF doctors across the country and across the world. Many of them have done many more cases of general IVF than I have. But if you've not done a surrogate cycle before, or if the office has never done a surrogate cycle before, you truly don't want to go to be the first one. It's like if you're going to have a plastic surgery or something and you're going to have your nose done, you don't want to go the guy who's doing his first nose. So I'm sorry for the example, but it's true with regards to surrogacy as well. Just because you can do IVF or just because the laboratory is good in creating embryos and all that, there are specific nuances of the things that we look for with regards to the, so, the, the donor, with regards to the surrogate, with regards to making sure that the couple is protected and everything is done properly. So medical screening, coordination of the cycle, FDA testing. Um, in 2005, let me just comment on the FDA testing, sorry. 2005, when already everybody loved America, so we gave them a reason to love America even more, okay? So the United States federal government, in its infinite wisdom, decided that we're not going to look at anybody's blood work outside of the United States. Only United States blood work is what we're going to apply for surrogacy. So in the old days, if I had a couple that's living in Europe and I could talk to you on the telephone and I say, okay, do this blood test, do this sperm test, and then send your sperm and we can do your surrogate case. It was a tremendous saving of time, a tremendous saving of money because you didn't have to fly to come and meet me. Unfortunately now, because of the United States federal government, after 2005, you have to physically come to meet your doctor. We have to do a history and, and, and physical on you. We have to repeat all the blood testing, HIV, hepatitis B and C, HTLV1, syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, West Nile virus, cytomegalovirus. It has to be done initially and within seven days of you producing sperm. For the egg donor, it has to be done initially and with 28 days of her giving eggs. So some people say, how come you're doing all this blood test? How come you're repeating all the blood tests? It's not me. It's required by, this, by the United States government. And part of the fun is they just show up. The FDA doesn't come announce. They knock on your door. They flash their bag. They show you their gun. We're serious. We want to see every case you've done in surrogacy. Well, since I've done so much surrogacy, and they can know that by practice reputation, by the amount of blood work that I ordered, they have the ability, they've already come and inspected us four times. And if they find that you didn't do the blood testing right, or you didn't do it in the time frame where, let's say you came to visit and you did your blood and your urine, and then your case is eight days later rather than seven days later, and if you didn't follow these seven days, they can fine us $100,000 and close our practice. So I'm sorry to say we're very, very specific and very um, on point with those things. And again, it's not our rules, it's, it's the rules of the, of the United States federal government, okay? We do the history and physical, we take a look inside the uterus, I take the time to make sure the inside of the uterus of the surrogate is normal. We, before I can physically see a surrogate in my office, we get her old records, making sure she had no issues getting pregnant, no issues with elevated blood pressure, diabetes, thyroid disease, kidney disease, 
No issues with premature delivery or premature contractions, okay? If a woman has had a cesarean section, she indeed can be a surrogate again, but if she's had three or four cesarean sections, there's a risk that the uterus itself can separate during pregnancy. It's called a uterine abruption, excuse me, a uterine rupture, and it is a horrible emergency because the woman can lose her life, the baby can be lost as well. So that's why we don't take women who's had four or five you know, cesarean sections. Take the time to look inside the uterus, make sure that inside the uterus is normal. All the blood work that we describe, we do for the donor and for the gentleman giving sperm, we do on the surrogate herself. We also do urine drug screening, urine screening for tobacco, urine screening for tobacco breakdown products. I don't smoke, but my husband does, okay? Well, you know what? If you're living with a guy who smokes, I can show you from our blood that it's just the same as you smoking. And so that's not really a good candidate to be a surrogate because she's exposed to the same breakdown products, the smoking, that would be very harmful for her during pregnancy. Okay? We do drug testing as well. We do alcohol testing as well. And this is done initially, and then some of our couples want it to be repeated, and we repeat it per, per the patient request. If she has a male partner, we test the male partner for all of these things as well. Generally, the surrogates have about a, a, a three-month period where they can't have sex with their partners. Okay? Donors also have a long period where they're not allowed to have sex with their partners, but the surrogates especially we check to make sure that the gentleman doesn't carry something like hepatitis that could possibly be transported to the wife, even something as simple as sharing a glass of water where if the gentleman had hepatitis, um, he could give it to the, to the wife. Again, we don't do much traditional surrogacy anymore. The pregnancy rates are lower, and as I mentioned, the legal documentation becomes very, very difficult. But if you're doing a traditional surrogate, you have to make sure that the ovarian reserve of the surrogate is normal as well. Egg donors. Again, we find all our egg donors through, through agencies or we help couples through agencies. Many of the male couples that I work with, they may have a family member, so it's not unusual for me to have a male-male couple and we use eggs from one, one woman uh, who's a family member, a niece, a sister, something like that. So in those scenarios, um, we're a little more lenient with regards to what we recommend in terms of age, but all the things that, that a regular donor has to have, this woman has to have as well. So we, you know, make, we go through the whole FDA blood and urine testing we mentioned before. Um, they also have to do the infectious disease cult, uh, testing as well. Um, and we make sure that, you know, by looking at the ovaries under ultrasound guidance to make sure that the number of follicles are normal and that the ovarian reserve is normal, okay? Um, as I mentioned, I do a lot of male-male couples. I do a lot of single-male couples. I do a lot of female-female couples where I get eggs from one partner. We create embryos from the sperm of a friend or a brother or something like that from the other partner and put embryos into that. So I was one of the first ever to do that case and I did a lot of international cases of that because many centers were not doing that. One of the big things that I think is very important and helpful for you is called pre-implantation genetic screening. So this is very, very important because I think it's really revolutionized the way we take care of patients. Now we've been doing genetic screening of embryos for over 15 years in our lab. And some of the breakthroughs have been that what you're doing is you're getting as much information about the embryo prior to putting it in. Now, in the old days, we removed a single cell at eight and we got a little bit of information, but there was a concern that you were harming the embryo when you were doing it that way. Now we're doing a biopsy on the fifth day, removing a cell or two per embryo after the embryos reached 120 cells. So you're not getting any damage to the embryo, and we get a full karyotype of results the next day. So let's say you do it on a Saturday, Sunday we have the results.